Losing is never fun. And it's even less fun when the New York Times is paying attention. But by 1929, that's what had happened. J. Gresson Machen had lost the fight against liberalism at Princeton Seminary. Even after reading Machen's warning in Christianity and Liberalism, the Presbyterian Church voted to reorganize Princeton to allow liberal theology on faculty. That would have been the perfect time to give up. But for Machen, the fight had never been about Princeton. True Christian doctrine could never belong to a single organization, no matter how influential. So Machen did what any God-fearing, independently wealthy bachelor would do. He quit. He poached Princeton's best faculty, and then he started his own seminary. Politics, technology, identity, power, science, everything seems to be changing. So why not faith? This is Christianity and Liberalism, a podcast based on the book by J. Gresson Machen. In this show, we'll be discussing a modern-day church in crisis and engaging with Machen's classic text to see what lessons we can learn and apply 100 years later. The line is drawn in the sand, Christ is gone and he's man Upon the rock of the word of God we will stand We bring the antithesis, the lamb's dripping wrist This is still the only answer for man's wickedness The line is drawn in the sand, Christ is gone and he's man Upon the rock of the word of God we will stand CNL, with Machen we will tell Faith in Christ still the only way to be redeemed from hell It's been 100 years since J. Gresson Machen published his book, Christianity and Liberalism. In an earlier episode, we learned how the fight Machen picked in the Presbyterian Church ultimately led to him being defrocked. But even before he was kicked out of his denomination, Machen moved from Princeton across the Delaware to Philadelphia to rebuild a fortress for the confessional faith he'd fought so hard for, Westminster Theological Seminary. In this episode, I'll be talking with Dr. Peter Loback. Peter has served as president of Westminster for more than 15 years. And in that time, he's had an up-close view of the dangers of liberal theology and the beauty of the biblical fidelity Machen argued for in Christianity and liberalism. To get us started, I asked Peter what we mean by the word liberal in the church as opposed to political liberalism. It almost goes back to what Schleiermacher did when he wrote, he said, I'm trying to find a Christianity that will be acceptable by the despisers of religion. <laughs> it is the liberal heart to say, how do we get along with people that hate what we stand for? Let's make it more acceptable. And we forget that Jesus said, they're going to hate you because they hated me first. <laughs> what I'm teaching you is countercultural. It is not what the world wants. It's what God wants. So maybe an illustration that helps others, it certainly has helped me, is liberal, the word liberty, I love liberty. We're not far away from the American July 4th celebration. I celebrate liberty. I want to be free. I don't want to be a slave to anybody. Mm -hmm. And I love liberality. I'm trying to build a new building, and I love donors who give with liberality. They're free to give and donate. So we're not talking about the word that way. Liberalism is saying, I want to be untethered from what keeps me from doing what I want to do or teach. And it's kind of like someone who's in space, spacewalking, he has that tether, said, you know, this thing is making my life so miserable. I'm just going to cut myself off so I can be free. <laughs> and off he floats. And he can do whatever he wants <laughs> until he runs demise. out of oxygen and he dies. <laughs> yeah, and that's what liberalism, that's it, it's we are becoming untethered from God himself in his word. And when we do that, we can be really free and people might really love us, but mm. the church will die. I've heard it put well, liberalism may have children, but they will have no grandchildren because they don't believe in evangelism eventually. They become so much like the world that there's no reason to really be a Christian wow. anymore because the world and, the, and Christianity are one and the same. 
It is our countercultural heavenly citizenship that really engages this world that makes us have the ability for the future because we keep calling people to be in the world, but not of the world. This difference between what the world wants and what God wants was critical to Machen's stand against liberalism. I asked Peter what the influence of Christianity and liberalism has been at Westminster more than 90 years since the seminary began. Well, first of all, we want to recognize that uh, Christianity and liberalism is a book that's been translated all over the world, has never gone out of print, and so it has always been there as a part of the Westminster story, sometimes celebrated, sometimes overlooked in different ways, but we've never forgotten uh, what creates the power of Christianity and liberalism, and that is in his opening address to create Westminster Seminary, he said we want to create specialists in the Bible. Our mission statement to this day preserves that language. Mm -hmm. And Christianity and liberalism is a result of a specialist in the Bible. He said, you cannot call this Christianity if the Bible is your authority. And so I would say his fundamental insight has been the defining force of Westminster all the way through, even in our mission statement. We want people that can go directly to the Greek, to the Hebrew, to historic documents that, of the church, uh, to confessions of faith, mm -hmm. uh, to practical application and say, is this authentic Christianity? Mm -hmm. That is Machen's spirit at work in the very work that Westminster has done through all of its history. Machen looks at distinctive areas that are timelessly important for the church. What is the Bible? Who is Jesus? What is the mission of the church? And I think those foundational <clears throat> questions should always be asked and say, well, who is Jesus? What is the Bible? Mm. What should the church be doing? What did the cross accomplish? Mm -hmm. Those questions never go out of date if you have historic Orthodox Christianity. And every generation needs to ask them afresh and say, do we believe what the Bible says about this? And if we don't, are we willing to say, I no longer believe the Bible? I no longer want to be tethered to historic orthodoxy. And be authentic. Don't pretend you're what you are. And I think that's really the great point. Machen never said you can't be a liberal. If you want to be a liberal, you have freedom to be a liberal. Be a liberal. Just don't claim to be what you're not. Mm -hmm. Be authentic. And mm -hmm. I think every generation needs that kind of reality check. Are you really a, a Christian or are you something other? Mm -hmm. And if you're something other, be authentic about it. And if you want to start a church to do that or a movement to do it, if you have freedom to do it, well, let's mm -hmm. go do it. You mm -hmm. know, it's interesting. Machen was against liberalism, but he was a libertarian, mm -hmm. which meant he gave everybody freedom to be who they are. Today, we have this cancel culture that hates libertarianism, which means he believed in free speech, disagree with each other. We both have a right to think each other are foolish. Well, that's what I think we should stand for is really historic Christians. We'll give you freedom to be who you are. Give us freedom to be who you are. Let's debate or choose not to talk, but be authentic. And we're going to call a spade a spade. If you are not a Christian by a biblical standard, we're going to say that. And if you want to call us crazy for believing the Bible, that's fine too. Mm -hmm. But we are followers of King Jesus. Mm -hmm. They thought they were foolish way back then to be followers of Jesus. But Paul, the great apostle, said the foolishness that we have of God is wiser than the wisdom of men. Mm -hmm. So we're fools enough to follow Christ because it's the heavenly wisdom of God. That question will never go out of date. It was true in the first century. It was true in Machen's day. It'll be true a hundred, a thousand years from now if the Lord should tarry. In our previous episode with Stephen Nichols, we learned a little about Machen's life story and his journey to write Christianity and liberalism. As president of Westminster, Peter is as intimately familiar with that story as anyone. I asked him if he could add some color to our portrait of Machen, especially around the time that the seminary was founded. Now, Christianity and Liberalism was published in 1923, 
while its author, J. Gresson Machen, was still a professor at Princeton Seminary and ordained in the Presbyterian Church, later called the PCUSA. Can you briefly summarize for our listeners what happened over the next 15 years that led to Machen leaving Princeton to found Westminster and eventually leaving the PCUSA to found the OPC? Well, there are several key points in that story. The first one is that uh, Machen is a presbyter had opportunity to deliver a speech at the Presbytery meeting in Chester, Pennsylvania, and he called it Christianity or liberalism. (laughs) And that was his first foray into the topic. And I think he realized he struck a nerve and it became then (laughs) Christianity and liberalism, and he put it in print. And basically he was calling out people that were using all the classic Christian words and saying you really have a different religion because you don't believe in the deity of Christ. You don't mm-hmm. believe in the bodily resurrection of Christ. You don't believe in the inspiration of the, or the virgin birth, all those things. And so that book came about. And then shortly thereafter, I think it's the very next year after the publication of his book, the General Assembly passed and had signed by hundreds of ministers what became known as the Auburn Affirmation. Mm-hmm. The General Assembly had been meeting and they gathered together and said, we are wanting to preserve the unity and the peace of the church. And they basically said there's academic liberty on all these big issues and that we must tolerate them and respect them. And based upon that, which was broadly accepted, it was then applied to the denominational seminaries. The Presbyterian Church had schools that were established by the denomination. And the classic one was the bastion of orthodoxy called Princeton Seminary. Mm-hmm. Today, we like to call it the old Princeton. <laughs> Basically, what happened is they had a reorganization of the board. The board is the final uh, review of all professors, hiring of direction of the seminary, etc. And the General Assembly said, you must have all theological viewpoints of our denomination welcomed and represented on the board. Well, that was the key point of Machen's understanding that the future of Princeton was essentially changed forever. Hmm. It would not be the seminary of Hodge and Warfield and Voss. It was going to be the seminary of the General Assembly with liberal theologians and maybe some respected conservatives. And he said, you know what? This is not going to be a school that will historically maintain the Westminster Confession of Faith, classic Christian orthodoxy. And he began to say, if this is where we're going to be, it's time for a new seminary. Well, he was able to persuade a group of of his fellow scholars to start a new seminary. And being a fairly successful family that he came from, He had resources and he had friends that said, we'll stand with you. And so he came to Philadelphia and launched a new seminary called Westminster Theological Seminary. Now, in the history of Presbyterianism, it's not a crime to start a school. Presbyterians start schools all the time. It's what we do. Mm -hmm. We're the greatest educators of Christianity ever. We want under schools, we want high schools, we want colleges, we want seminaries, we want graduate schools. We do it all. We're educators. And so Machen was not in trouble to start a school that was independent. And so in Philadelphia on Pine Street, he started a school in a brownstone house rented from Oswald T. Alice, Old T. Alice, Old Testament Alice. And that's where they started. And amazingly, the year they opened the doors was the year of the Great Depression, 1929. And if anything should have put a nonprofit business out of business, it was Mm -hmm. the Great Depression. And what kept it going was that Machen had the resources to say, we're going to suffer together, but I'm not going to let you starve. You may not get paid all the time, but we'll make sure you're alive. And we're not going to let this place fail. And he said, students can come for free if you qualify. Hmm. Isn't that amazing? Hmm. Full tuition with Princetonian professors, academics, and orthodox conservative scholars. And that was the founding faculty of Westminster. So we have those great names of Robert Dick Wilson, Cornelius Van Til, John Murray, Machen himself, uh, Ned Stonehouse, the great uh, group of uh, great leaders. And so that started the school and things were going along well. 
But Machen, being utterly consistent with his commitment, said, you know, it's not only that we need to have pastors who believe the gospel and uphold the Bible, we need to have missionaries that also are believers in the historic Christian faith. We're not a social agency. We're not just mm -hmm. sending out people to do good things, to plant farms, to start schools, to uh, help uh, have hospitals. That's all good. Mm -hmm. But we need to have people doing that because they're bringing people face to face with the historic gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Yeah. And so he started what became known as the Independent Board of Foreign Missions. His seminary had to be independent because if it was under the General Assembly, you'd have to have liberal uh, board members and liberal professors. So it had to be independent. So Westminster has always been a little bit of an oxymoron, a Presbyterian school that's independent. It was historically necessary. Well, so with the mission board. Bah, but this was an interesting issue because now it was attacking the heart of the Presbyterian Church's most lucrative fundraising machine, foreign missions. And that's always been true. The heart of the Christian cares about the nations. And suddenly, like Luther, when he said indulgences don't work and the money stopped flowing from Germany to Rome, he got in trouble. Well, Machen started an organization that said, don't send your money to the General Assembly missionaries, send them to the independent board. Well, those were fighting words. Mm -hmm. And that created then an insistence that he cease and desist. And he said, how can I cease and desist sending out missionaries? And without an opportunity to defend himself, he was brought all the way to General Assembly, found guilty of insubordination and defrocked. Hmm. So sometimes they say Machen was a uh, person who divided the church. He was simply trying to maintain the gospel. He didn't divide the church. They kicked him out. Let's be honest. They kicked him out without even letting him make a defense. Mm. And so what do you do when you're an Orthodox Christian? Your church has thrown you out. You want to have a church to serve the Lord. Mm. And so he said, well, we need to start again. And there were many who recognized the injustice of what he'd gone through, and the importance of what he was committed to. And so that began the process of establishing a new church. The first name of the church was the Presbyterian Church of America. Well, that name didn't stand because they were brought to court and said, you can't have a name that close. It's infringement of our copyright name. And so they took a name that basically said, we're the Orthodox and you're the unorthodox Presbyterians. It became the Orthodox Presbyterian Church. Well, Machen now was now the head of a new seminary, a new mission board, and a new church, and he was working himself to death. Mm -hmm. And he was trying to find friends everywhere, and he went in the middle of the winter to the cold Dakotas. And there he came down with pneumonia, and he died mm -hmm. New Year's Day, 1937. God used Machen in ways that we can't fully understand because he planted that fundamental understanding. You can use words and not mean what they really mean. Mm -hmm. How do you know what they mean? You bring them back to the Bible, <laughs> to biblical authority. And more than that, you bring them back to the reformational creed, the confession of faith. And so to his credit, he said, I want a seminary that's not named by a city like Princeton. We're not going to call it Philadelphia Theological Seminary. We're going to name it after a creed, the Westminster Confession of Faith, which forces you to look at its very first chapter that has the most magnificent statement on the authority, clarity, inspiration, and trustworthiness of the Word of God. And so Westminster has to always deal with the fact, are we living up to our name? Mm -hmm. And Machen gave that to the seminary, which says, we will be faithful to the Scriptures because the Word of God has established us as a school. Living up to that name wouldn't always be easy. As the years passed, the faculty and board of trustees at Westminster learned that they weren't immune to controversy or the influence of the liberal theology that Machen warned against. In the early 2000s, Westminster was at the center of an intense theological debate over the meaning of inerrancy, whether the Bible was the flawless, inspired Word of God or not. When I arrived at uh, 
Westminster as the president, I was probably the most surprised person of all. I had no idea that I would be the last man standing. And huh. we can go into why all of that was, but I thought, well, my main job will be to help raise money, maybe get some new uh, driveways on the campus because they're all aging and cracking and <laughs> watching my great faculty do their work. Well, six weeks into my job, I got a letter from one of our recent alumni and he said, I've just read a book by one of your professors and I need to ask you, is Westminster becoming another Fuller Seminary? Mm. And I was stunned by that. And I realized that Fuller Seminary had been a, a great school committed to historic inspiration and inerrancy of scripture that had moved beyond that to be a great academic school, still Christian, but much more broad in its bibliology and its theological mm -hmm. structure. Mm -hmm. I thought, that can't possibly be. And so I brought that to the faculty and I discovered a conversation was a beginning to brew mm -hmm. uh, through the writings of various hermeneutical teachers on our faculty. And uh, over time, after about 18 months of behind the scenes discussions, I realized that there was a commitment to go in a new direction and without using professors' names, I can use theological words. Mm -hmm. Are we going to maintain what we call Christocentric hermeneutics, that Christ is the heart of the Bible from Genesis to Revelation, or are we going to jettison that for a what could be a complementary or it could be an antithetical system mm -hmm. called Christotelicism? A Christotelic view says, that Christ is the ultimate goal of Scripture. Well, I like that as long as it's coupled with Christocentricity. Mm -hmm. But if it's to be in place of Christocentricity, what it argues is, is that the Bible can go all over the place, make mistakes, have redundancies, unnecessary things, unclear things, maybe contradictory things, but it gets us to the right conclusion at the end of the day. In other words, we get Christ, but we don't have a Bible that we can fully trust and be confident is unified, non-contradictory, authoritative, and clearly the inspired Word of God without error in its autographs. Mm -hmm. Wow, that was an amazing, I had no idea I was walking into that. And so there was a really critical moment where I was in my office and say, I am on a powder keg. What in the world am I going to do? I'd been a pastor. I'd love to unify things, not divide things. If Jay Gresham Machen were here and Cornelius Van Til were here, and I said to them, what should Westminster Seminary do at this moment? I knew exactly what they'd have said to me. We gave up everything to preserve the purity of the Word of God, that Christianity would be biblically based, and that would have the courage to say no to a liberalism that's rejecting the truth of the Bible. And I said, you know what, if I am going to be fired for standing for the authority of the Bible, I'll wear it as a badge of honor. So I said, I've got to stand with our founders. That's what our mission mm -hmm. is. That's our faith. That's our heritage. And let me tell you, I survived by one vote in one board meeting, and a lot of our faculty were upset. Some of our board ultimately left after we had to make some hard decisions. And... Uh, our, our good friend, the late uh, Dr. Harry Reeder said, well, we've just had a Scotch-Irish revival. We've had nine board members leave and we've had some faculty leave and now we need to be faithful to start fresh. Hmm. It was a hard moment. It was not what I wanted to do, but when we come to an institution, the institution is not us. We have a trust to preserve what our forefathers gave to us. And if we're going to change it, we should be authentic about it. We shouldn't do it surreptitiously, uh, faking one thing and doing another. I felt like if we're going to give up the theology, the Westminster Confession, we should no longer call ourselves Westminster Theological Seminary. We ought hmm. to be have a courage to say we no longer agree with Machen. We no longer agree with the Westminster Standards uh, Confession of Faith, Chapter 1. But if we do then we need to make the decisions that flow from that foundational commitment of who we are in our identity. And so mm -hmm. that's what our decision was. So I would say Machen's work and his commitment and their courage certainly guided to what I chose to do as a leader. 
And I'm grateful, even though we've gone through some very difficult times, it's been a joy to build a faculty that continue to have a heart to say the Word of God is the foundation of what we do. And uh, my prayer is that we fought that battle for this generation, but we have a new form of progressivism that is a new kind of liberalism that's coming along. We may have people today that no longer say, we're not debating whether the Bible's inspired, we're not debating whether Jesus is God or whether resurrection is true. We're just debating whether its ethics are applicable to in us anymore. Mm -hmm. Whether we have to believe what the Bible said about marriage or sexuality or gender. We're all Christians. We believe the theology. We believe, but we're just redefining these things. Mm -hmm. Well, guess what? It's the same issue. Is the Bible true or is it not? We've moved it from maybe theology of Christology and soteriology, but we've now moved it to ethics and mm -hmm. ecclesiology. Do we have the courage to say Christianity is Christianity? Our confessions still speak to us. Now, you, you stayed in the, the office of president by a single vote. Uh, that means a lot of people did not like you. <laughs> Dur during a lot those... of people don't like me today still. That's not changed. <laughs> so you got used to it. <laughs> uh, yeah. But in the, in the dark uh, night of the soul, those dark nights that you had inevitably, and Machen had, and many others who took a stand for truth uh, have obviously had in the past, uh, what what brought you encouragement during those times? Well, I think the first thing that brought me encouragement is that I'm a Reformation scholar, and I I thought of Luther standing at the Diet of Worm saying, you must recant. And he said, my conscience is bound by the Word of God. Okay, of course, dramatic additions may have been made to it, but he said, here I stand, God help me, I can do no other. Whether mm -hmm. he said all those words, his actions were, let good and kindreds go, this mortal life also, the body they may kill, God's truth abideth still. And I thought, you know what, if I get uh, assaulted, removed, attacked, and I've tried to be faithful to the scripture, that's okay. I thought about Calvin, and I thought about how he risked his life time and time again, even distancing himself from Luther, who was the great champion, and said, I have to be faithful to Scripture. Mm -hmm. And I looked at those Scottish martyrs in the Presbyterian Church, and John Knox saying, give me Scotland or else I die, as he stood before the very queen who could have taken his life and said, I'm going to preach the Word of God to you. I said, the theology of those that have gone before us, they had courage. Can I have the courage that's requisite in this moment in time to do my calling at this time? And mm -hmm. there are many times I felt utterly inadequate. I did not know how it would come out, but I felt like I would try to be as faithful as I could. And so very the pragmatic answer to my question is I still was pastoring part-time at my church. And I thought, well, maybe they'll take me back full-time if I get fired from Westminster. <laughs> I will at least be able to go back and have a place to preach. And maybe they'll forgive me for messing up as a president. Well, lo and behold, here I am 18 years later and I'm still going. I'm, I, I was surprised That's that right. I was hired. I'm surprised I'm still in the role. I hope whatever I've done, if people hate me, They'll know I've tried to be faithful to Scripture imperfectly for sure, but a desire to honor the purpose and mission of Westminster mm. under the Word of God. Part of what motivated Peter and the Westminster Board and faculty was the knowledge that the church's doctrine affects lives. It really matters what people believe about the Bible and Jesus, the very things Machen wrote so passionately about in his book. I asked Peter about those real-life consequences, whether a difficult stand for truth is worth the cost. Well, the, part of the tragic story that we've had at Westminster is that um, for a 10-year period or so, students that came through with a more higher critical, friendly spirit began to imbibe that. They went far beyond their professors. Hmm. And we found students 
who are saying, I am no longer a Christian. I no longer can believe the Bible. I'm not going into ministry. I am now an atheist. Mm. Oh my goodness. That is a product of those that were schooled in that tradition. And they had a Westminster background. Mm. My heart broke. I said, we are basically giving people the basis to say, I can't trust my Bible. Why would I believe it's gospel? Wow. Now, I can't look into any hearts. I'm glad I'm not the sovereign Lord of the universe. He is working with each of those people, in their own, but by their own words, people that have left their calling toward ministry, etc. I am thrilled that there are those who are saying, I have found great comfort in the fact that I have a place to stand in the word of God. In fact, our critics, this isn't true universally, but at least some have come back and said, you know, we were really angry at what Westminster did and some of the faculty issues as you struggled to try to clarify our history. We're very mad at you. And then as they've watched the unfolding of some of those that held that, they've hum humbly come back and said, we're sorry, <laughs> you did the right thing. Now, I don't take any joy in that, but it was at least uh, encouraging recognition that what was seen in incipient form that blossomed into a more full uh, teaching that was abandoning the fullness of biblical authority, they recognized that our decision was the right one. You know, I, I'm thrilled, for example, that Greg Beal, who was in an endowed chair at Wheaton, we went and recruited him with three or four faculty members in person and said, Greg, we need you to come and teach for us for a while. People say biblical theology will never be taught at Westminster again. We've destroyed the program. So we laid out what we needed. He said, I'm gonna come. I would be glad to finish my career at an institution that was willing to go bankrupt for the truth of God's word. And so Greg gave us 11 years of faithful work until he retired to go back to be with family in Dallas. And we're glad to send him home as one of our great friends who established again the credibility that you can do biblical theology, the unity of Old and New Testament exegesis, and that biblical narrative in a unified way that honors scholarship and the truth of Scripture. So we're really glad for that. And that, that I think, has been a real blessing to the church that recognizes that scholarship and biblical faithfulness in the Vassian tradition is alive and well at Westminster, and we're grateful mm -hmm. for that. And that has blessed a lot of churches because people on Sundays come out of sermons, I can't believe you can find Jesus in Genesis or in Malachi, in Isaiah, in the Psalms, the Bible's unified. And that's a fruit of that kind of uh, biblical fidelity. And so it's a blessing churches. I've heard many churches say, you know, I'm so glad we have a Westminster trained pastor because I'm hearing the Bible bringing me the truth of Christ from cover to cover. Mm -hmm. And that's the legacy of a fidelity, a biblical theology founded and a high view of scripture. Now, in another episode, we spoke with Al Mohler, who's president of Southern Baptist Theological Seminary. Uh, and the battle that he had was to go back to the confessional roots. So why is it so important for churches and seminaries to have confessional documents like the Westminster Confession of Faith or something similar at their foundation? We have what's always called mission drift. In other words, I love to use the illustration. Imagine two great ships, it's the high seas, and they're sailing in the same direction. You can, they're so close that you can talk to the person on board the other ship. But if they're just a little bit off on a degree, in a mile, in two miles, in 10 miles, and 100 miles, they're out of sight of each other. And that is because there is a directional shift. If you are not tethered clearly to your foundation, you're gonna move in a direction. Another way to look at it is more practical. If you're, if you're a parent, and you have children like we are right now, we're, we're talking in the summer. You take your kids to the shore and you're watching your kids having lots of fun splashing. And you look down for a little while to read the book under the umbrella and you look up and you don't see your kids mm. and you panic. Where are they? Oh. 
and you realize they're 100 feet farther down the shore because they're, they didn't swim there. It's the current that's utterly invisible that in a blink of an eye has taken them entirely out of your sight. So mm -hmm. I like to say, if you're going to walk level on the mountainside, you always have to be walking uphill because you're fighting a force of gravity. Mm -hmm. And so your confession, if you will, is your standard that keeps you faithful. It's your navigation system. And as a historian, it's also the gift of the Holy Spirit in the prior generations, because we're not rediscovering the truth fresh every year. For the first time, we are finding the truths that others that have gone before us have relished and celebrated, and often we've forgotten and we need to be reminded of. That doesn't mm -hmm. mean we can't make authentic progress in the great truth of Scripture, because its truth is infinitely deep and vast. But, you know, the main outlines of the Bible have been established well for us, and we do well. And so that's why I like that verse in Hebrews 13, 7. It says, uh, remember those who taught you the word of God. Consider their faith and imitate it. And so that's a great verse that gives uh, church historians job security. We have to remember <laughs> those who've gone before us. But it's saying, what did they teach? What was the outcome of their faith? Don't imitate their lives, imitate their faith. Mm -hmm. And so the book of Jude talks about the faith that has once and for all been delivered to the saints. There is a body of truth that does not change. It's changeless because it's eternity that's entered into time. Its mm -hmm. application changes, its teachers change, its language changes, but its truth is unchangeable because it's grounded in the very nature of God and his truth. And that's why Jesus could say in John 17, 17, sanctify them through your word, O Lord, your word is truth. That's mm -hmm. our high priest praying for us before he goes to the cross. The word of God, it's true. And that is how we become holy before God. And if it keeps shifting, we don't know what holiness is. We don't know what the word of God is, but it's been given to us. And so that is our bedrock. So I'm meandering in many sort of ways, but I think the confession of faith grounded on Scripture gives us, if you will, the North Star, which is how navigators are able to travel the high seas with all the big waves. They always have a place to aim at, say, this is what God's Word says. This is what our confession tells us. Let's be faithful, because that will keep us from mission drift. It will also keep us strong before a world that wants to swallow us up especially in this day where the long arm of government is reaching into your pulpits on Sundays as preachers and say, don't preach that text or you'll be in trouble. We're going to come after you. It's going to take courage to stand up and say, mm -hmm. thus says the word of God. Yeah. Before he passed away, Pastor Harry Reeder wrote an article titled Christianity and Progressivism. In it, Reader argued that, quote, progressive Christianity at its core is liberal Christianity 2.0. I asked Peter if he too recognized parallels between progressive Christianity and liberalism. Yes, because I think what it's wanting to do is say, we are Christians. We want the church. We want to preach from the Bible. We want people to be saved. But there's some things that we are just wrong about nowadays. Gender is fluid. Sexual relationships that are consensual are not the same as what the Bible talks about. Uh, marriage needs to be defined in all sorts of new ways because it's better this way. And by the way, it is more acceptable to the world. And it allows us to be appreciated more by uh, governments and academia and other communities and other denominations. And so the progressivism, while it's not the same theological debate as the past, is really at the heart of what was going on with liberalism in Machen's day. And that is we want a place at the table. We want mm -hmm. to be accepted by the higher ups. We want to be accepted in the academic setting. We want to be accepted in the government setting. We want to be accepted by interdenominational relations. We want the culture to like us. And I think progressivism 
is constantly the desire to say, can't we just get along with everybody? And the answer ought to be, as much as lies within me, I will live at peace with all men. That's very biblical. We don't mm -hmm. want to be confrontational. We want to be peacemakers. But it cannot be peacemaking and getting along at the expense of the Word of God, because mm -hmm. then we have ceased to become Christians. Eventually, in the light of Scripture and with the creeds and confessions of the Church to guide us, it becomes clear that progressive ideology is poisonous for the Christian faith. But a focus on what's wrong with our opponents won't save us from our own temptations. So how are we as Christians to protect ourselves against destructive ideologies? Well, we are all capable of pride, of wanting to be accepted, and it might be a different group we want to be accepted in. The, what's really hard for all of us is authentic humility, which is the humility under the Word of God and say, I can always be taught. Show me if I'm wrong. Show me by the Bible. I love that verse in the book of Acts where it talks about the Brians and the Thessalonians. Mm -hmm. The Brians were more noble than the Thessalonians because they studied the scriptures yeah. to see if Paul was right. Isn't that mm -hmm. amazing? Yep. Well, that's the kind of people we want is that Okay, we're in this confessional tradition. Is that really what we find in the Bible? Hmm. Are mm -hmm. we doing, well, we're Presbyterian, so let's believe Presbyterian. No, we're Presbyterians. We're blessed with our tradition. Now let's find it in the scriptures and then delight in it with humility because we found it in God's word. So yeah. we can easily fall into uh, just automatic, this is who we are. So I think that's also what Machen spoke against. He wanted to demonstrate in his classic books like uh, the origin of Paul's religion. I want to show you that his religion can be defended as a supernatural religion. He wanted mm -hmm. to demonstrate the history of the claim of the virgin birth. He wanted to show with scholarly expertise what Christianity was versus its liberal denial. He was a scholar. He wanted people to know the Greek language. And his book uh, on New Testament Greek is still in print. It has a 100th anniversary too. It's still in print, amazing. He mm. wanted scholarship. So scholars are always willing to be students. They say, okay, I hear what you've taught me. Now let's see if we can find it in the Word of God. Let's discuss it. So I don't want unthinking conservatism. I want us to be faithfully discussing it. And you know what? When we discuss it, we'll find that our forefathers missed some things and we can make some new advances on the classic Word of God because it's it's dimensions are vast. As we closed our conversation, I asked Peter if he could recommend one chapter of Christianity and liberalism for our listeners to get started with. Uh, so Machen structures the book in Christianity and liberalism around six topics, doctrine, God and man, the Bible, Christ, salvation, and the church. But if you could recommend just one of those chapters to Christians today, which one would it be and why? I think that's a really great question. I Tom Muller hates it because <laughs> it's too I th difficult. I think, but the way that, I think I would ask a person to say, look at those six topics and what is bugging you? Mm. What is the issue? Then read that chapter. Oh, because I think, you, I think you'll find tremendous wisdom on if you're struggling and say, I'm struggling with what they're saying about the Bible, read that one. If you're saying my church is really messed up, then read the church. If you're struggling about what, what is this salvation stuff? Read this. If you're wondering or debating about Jesus, read that. Mm -hmm. So in other words, uh, it's, it's a wonderful, you don't have to read it from cover to cover. You can jump into any chapter because of its poignancy, its clarity, its timelessness. It will get right to the heart of the matter and you'll start saying, wow, I've been helped. So mm -hmm. I really, I think I would ask that first question and then direct them and say, then read that one first. Now, oh, that's a great response. Many thanks to my guest, Dr. Peter Loback. For listeners who are interested, you can find that article by Harry Reader that I mentioned free online at wm.wts.edu. Join me next time for my conversation with pastor and author Eric Watkins as we discuss Mason's chapter on the church. 
If you enjoyed today's episode, please visit wts.edu backslash give to find out how you can support Westminster's mission to train specialists in the Bible for the future of Christ Church. This episode of Christianity and Liberalism was brought to you by Westminster Seminary Press. Westminster Seminary Press has published a brand new edition of the book this show is based on, Christianity and Liberalism by J. Gressa Machen. This 100th anniversary edition features a new forward by Kevin DeYoung and is available to order now at wtsbooks.com. Listeners to this podcast can get a free download of the Christianity and Liberalism audiobook at checkout when you enter the promo code MACHEN23. That's M A C H E N. This podcast was based on the book Christianity and Liberalism by J. Gressa Machen and hosted by David Brionis. This episode was produced by Josh Curry and Jimmy Atkins. Audio captured by Paul Quorum, edited and engineered by Will Bowblitz. Our theme song was written by Timothy Brindle and produced by Nobody Special. Thanks for listening. To demonstrate the two completely different religions Liberalism denies man's wicked condition And divine inspiration with which scripture was written Us Christians are convinced scripture's truly factual But liberalism denies the supernatural Matron's book definitely showed Christianity and liberalism are diametrically opposed It's not a different version of Christianity It has opposite views of God and humanity Often disguised with Christian terminology They baptize the serpents absurd philosophy. So when we call you a liberal it's not just political but rejecting his virgin birth and all of his miracles from trusting in science but against god it's disgusting defiance self is your trust and reliance the line is drawn in the sand christ is god and he's man upon the rock of the word of god we will stand we bring the antithesis the lamb's dripping wrists is still the only answer for man's wickedness the line is drawn in the sand christ is god and he's man upon the rock of the word of god we will stand CNL with Machen, we will tell. Faith in Christ still the only way to be redeemed from hell. Machen press men, to be honest. Don't call it Christian if it essentially is godless. Christianity's based on events God accomplished. Christ was sent to bring redemption, he promised. Yeah. Not just an ethical leader, respectable teacher, but God in the flesh. Yes, our blessed redeemer, an affront to human pride. You can only be saved by faith in Christ who was crucified. Amen. Our greatest needs to be redeemed by the Son. It's not what we're Jesus do but what Jesus has done since we're slaves that doubt pride and lust we're in desperate need of rescue that's outside of us an understatement to say that we're flawed in need of what Machen called a creative act of God because we're torn by sin we've been abhorring him not just sick but dead we must be born again God's enemies his arrogant opponents who can only be saved by vicarious atonement judgment fell on Christ in my place unrighteous guilty sinners are only righteous by grace scriptures historical acts they are certain Jesus the God man the supernatural person we need new hearts he's the compassionate surgeon by his death and resurrection he's smashing the serpent the line is drawn in the sand Christ is God and he's man upon the rock of the word of God we will stand we bring the antithesis the lamb's dripping wrists is still the only answer for man's wickedness the line is drawn in the sand Christ is God and he's man upon the rock of the word of God we will stand CNL with Machen we will tell faith in Christ still the only way to be redeemed from My hell. intention is to show, and I'll mention in this flow, Machen's words are as useful as a century ago. Uh-huh. Liberalism breeds destruction, it's hopeless. Today it's deconstruction and wokeness. Rooted in paganism, atheism, like Satan's mission to make CRT state religion. These abominations we see to this day in denominations like the PC USA. Why embrace Machen's great wisdom? In light of the claims of his racism, in 1913, Machen wrote Mom complaining, angry about Princeton's campus integration. I can't believe the decision of Warfield, but this cancer of heart, I'm sure the Lord healed. See, Warfield became Machen's mentor, an instrument for Machen to repent more, showing his need of the Savior to change him. But consider the Lord's grace of sanctification. Machen became friends with an 
African American named Charlie Machen gladly had cherished him. As a matter of fact, Charlie had a cataract. Skin color didn't matter as Machen had his back. Paid for the operation, stayed with him in the hospital. Christ changing Machen, not an impossible obstacle. From his love for his friend Charlie, it's quite clear Christ was changing Machen partly. Any bigotry left, it's not there any longer. Perfected now in the presence of his father. The line is drawn in the sand. Christ is gone and he's man upon the rock of the word of God. We will stand. We bring the antithesis. The lamb's dripping wrist is still the only answer for man's wickedness. The line is drawn in the sand. Christ is gone and he's man upon the rock of the word of God. We will stand. CNL with Machen, we will tell. Faith in Christ still the only way to be redeemed from hell. Oh.